can do. As uh, and as we've been talking about the last month, and as one more sermon in this series, uh, we need to seek and get God's guidance because there is no secret what of what He can do. It's known to everybody. All you need to do is take out and take a look and reach out and grab it because it's not a secret. Our text today uh, comes from the book of Ephesians. Actually, comes from the scripture I read. From the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10 of Ephesians 5. And again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Um, As we've said these last few weeks, God's guidance is available. We can seek it, we can receive it, and we can trust it. Information about his guidance is available in his guidebook. It's available in the Bible. And we can develop, as we said last week, a submissive spirit to his guidance through prayer. But having followed these steps, seeking, receiving, trusting, and being submissive to his guidance, having followed these steps, we may still lack confidence and clarity in doing God's will because the process can be confusing and frustrating at times. There's more to it than you originally thought. Uh, Just like anything you buy that needs assembly, some of the instructions are not crystal clear. Uh, I've often tried to assemble something that says in instructions it could be done in 30 minutes and three hours later I'm still trying to assemble this thing and when I get done I've got some screws left over and some parts left over so I'm confused even though there are instructions. Now determining God's will can sometimes be confusing. For example, uh, as when uh, People have differing interpretations of the truth. Their interpretations are different. For example, uh, the scriptures say that we should obey government authority, and it also says we should obey God only. Sometimes these things appear to be in conflict. And we saw that uh, early in the pandemic when... uh, uh, the government said we could not meet inside. Remember that? Cannot meet inside. Now, one side quoted Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. And here's what it says. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. That's what one side said. Okay, the other side, though, quoted a couple other scriptures. Uh, Take, for example, the one in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Remember when Peter and John were going to the temple, and they they said to the guy, "Uh, I don't have any money. This is all I have in the name of Jesus. Give and walk. And they were arrested. And the Jewish leaders told them, well, okay, you're going to have to stop teaching and talking about Jesus. But here was their response, Acts 14, 18 through 20. Then they called them back in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And the folk who, who, who are on the opposite side of, of, of uh, uh, being subject to 
government authorities also use look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, the people who, who uh, took this view uh, uh, said that it meant a biblically mandated worship could not be done virtually. Now, believers today have the same differing views of opinion and confusion on, over masks and vaccinations. Now, how do we overcome this confusion and still respond to God's guidance and clear obedience to his will? Neither of those are absolute, right? So how, how can we overcome the confusion and still respond to God's guidance and his will with clear obedience? Well, there are three things we can do. One, we can walk in the light we already have. Two, we can test to approve what is acceptable to the Lord. And three, we can confront and correct the unfruitful works of darkness. So let's start with the fact that we can first, first we can walk in the light we already have. Okay, let's look back at our text again, Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the, of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Now, it's important for us to remember that all of us have been exposed to the darkness of sin, and we've all walked in that darkness. Now, our previous proximity to the darkness of sin requires that we now live in the light, that we now can listen to and follow Jesus Christ. We must recognize that we do not have all of the answers, but that we do, that we are committed to the one that does have all the answers. We don't have all the answers but we're committed to the one who does have all the answers. So we can walk in the light that we already have. Walking in the light that you have makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If you want, for example, if you wanted to become a long-distance runner or uh, like the people participating in a triathlon today, wouldn't you first begin to run, swim, or cycle short distances? If your goal is to be able to speak a foreign language fluently, doesn't it follow that you would first learn to speak in short sentences? So walk in the light you already have. Our walking in the light does not mean that we always walk with much stability as we might later. The child, you know, the child that learns to walk doesn't stop if they fall, doesn't it? Because it may be falling down when you're trying to walk. In walking, we start out shaky, then we walk, begin to walk with stability. So begin by walking in the light that you already have. So we can respond to God's guidance by starting to walk in the light that we already have, no matter how little or how much of that light. We have. Next, we can test to approve what is acceptable to the Lord. I call your attention to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then 
you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So you can test to approve what is acceptable to the Lord. That's how we can get rid of some of this confusion and frustration. Now, when you go to school, any school, students will be tested. There will be tests. Now, we may not like it, uh, but there's a purpose for those tests. The purpose is, one, to aid in the learning process and the approval process. So we can test to approve what's acceptable to the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that God, that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? Test. One, walk in the life you already have, then test to approve what is acceptable. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Test yourself, right, and confirm your calling. That's a way that we can make sure that we're not confused and deal with the frustration of seeking God's will and his guidance. Just like uh, no new machinery is ever marketed that is not tested. New machinery is tested so that the defects can be eliminated. Our conduct is to be subjected to testing, to the testing process, for the purpose of being acceptable to the Lord. By this testing, we experience clarity in his guidance. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about seeking God's guidance, knowing his will. So where does this testing take place? Where does it happen? Well, this testing happens right out there in the world where the darkness is. And out here in the world, we are to rely on all the testing devices we can, beginning with the Bible, the, Holy, the, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. They can guide us and test our conduct, test, our, test us to make sure that we are following the guidance of God and his will. Now, it's very comforting and strengthening to know what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear brothers, friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The testing happens in the world, but be strengthened by the fact that God is the one that works in you to act in order for you to fulfill his good purposes. So in addition now, in addition to the word and the spirit, there are at least four other testing devices that we can use to see if we are, uh, uh, see if we are, Approving what's acceptable to the Lord. There's the Word, there's the Holy Spirit, and there's four of us. I'm going to talk about those right now. One is the conscience of the person being tested. Two is the counsel of other Christians. Three, common sense. And four, circumstances. So, the conscience, your conscience, stores information that we have received uh, in the past from resources about what's right 
and what's wrong. As we make our decisions, our consciences either affirm or pull down the attitudes or actions that we are about to take. Now, the conscience that has been exposed to darkness is not fully trustworthy. That's what it says in Titus chapter 1, verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. So if the conscience that's been exposed or influenced to darkness is not trustworthy. We, though, we who have been taught the truth, our conscience will bear witness with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Romans 9, 1 and 2, say, Now I speak the truth of Christ and am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. So the testing device is the conscience of the person being tested, our conscience. Number two, we can test to see what's acceptable to the Lord through the counsel of other Christians. We talked about that a little bit last week or week before. Believers are instructed to teach and admonish each other. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 tell us this. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful that the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That also says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and now let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some have the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we are to teach and admonish each other so we can test what's acceptable to the Lord through the counsel of other Christians. Now, let me caution you, though, that no believer is to become our highest authority on truth. No believer is the highest authority on truth. However, more experienced and more mature believers who show by their lives obedience to the word, their counsel should be sought. They should be sought for advice, right? So we got uh, our own consciences. We got the counsel of other believers. Then there is common sense. Remember, we're talking about we're talking about how to test the guidance of God to prove what's acceptable to God. Common sense. Titus two verse twelve tells us that we are to live soberly. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all peoples, people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly, and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the best hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us all from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his own, very own, eager to do what is good. So what this means is that we ought to have a sound, healthy mind of common sense, a sound, healthy mind. Now, again, I'm going to caution us, common sense is never to be accepted as complete sense because sometimes God leads us in ways that 
don't seem sensible, but we're depending on the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God leads us to think that we think it, that this doesn't make a lot of sense. But if we use the other testing devices along with this, we will approve see, what God's will is. Our minds, with our minds, we ought to use, we ought to use our minds in testing the will of God. Testing to make sure that we are in God's will and following his guidance. Finally, we can test what's acceptable to God through circumstances. Let me give you a, uh, an example. Let's say your uh, relationship with your children and with the children that you've known in the church make you think that you should be a school teacher. Well, your education, though, hasn't equipped you to teach. And you cannot get a teaching certificate. Your circumstances show you that either you had to go to school again or that you are not equipped or not the right person to teach school. Yet, circumstances alone can never be sufficient as a testing device. God uses circumstances often to speak to us. We've talked about that in the past. One of the ways we look to see whether God is speaking to us is through circumstances. So we can test what's acceptable to God through circumstances. When we respond to God's guidance with clear obedience to his will, we can walk in the light we already have. We can test to approve what's acceptable to the Lord, and we can then confront and correct the unfruitful works of darkness. In other words, we can rebuke or silence the works of darkness to bring out conviction or confession of guilt. Now, we can do that by our words, but we can do it more significantly by our conduct, by our action. Now, some people may become uncomfortable by what we say, what we say and do, but that's the way God uses to reach the hearts of many people that are in darkness. Maybe it's uncomfortable to you, but that's the way God may want to reach someone. The point is that God's guidance is not given to us to enable us to live sheltered lives free from contact with people who are motivated by evil. We are not God did not save us. Jesus did not save us for us to sit back in a, uh, uh, and be shielded from those who have, who have to deal with evil and darkness. As a matter of fact, we are to go out to them and let our light shine. So the point is that God's guidance, we, we've been talking about guidance, knowing God's guidance for his will. The point is guidance is given to us, not to enable us just to be sheltered, but enables us to go out and motivate, talk to those who are motivated by evil. Look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. You have the word of God in your mind. You have your eyes on Jesus, but your body is in the world. You have the word of God in your mind. Your eyes are on Jesus, but you are in the world. So that's how we demonstrate the truth and call others to the truth, by following God's guidance and his will. God's will is that everyone should be saved. That's what it says in Peter, right? All right? We are the ones that Jesus is now with the Lord. We are the ones that have that responsibility. Jesus told us to go into the world to preach the gospel so folk would be saved. 
But he said he's with us even then. So we are to test God's guidance. We are to approve of God's guidance. We are to exhibit the fact that we're guided, being guided by the Lord, and that, that's so that we can reach others who are living in darkness. Now, each person, each one of us who is receiving God's guidance receives it under God's divine protection. When we receive his guidance, we discover. When we receive his guidance, when we really understand his guidance, we will discover that God is our refuge. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 3 say, God is our refuge and strength and every present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surge. Once we understand that each of us that has, is receiving God's guidance receives it under his divine protection. But God's guidance must be tested in the world. It must be tested in the world where the light and darkness meet. God's guidance is tested where the light and darkness meet. We are the light, but we are to go out and meet the darkness. The conflict between light and darkness, good and evil, may be frightening sometimes. But we can be confident in knowing that all that God provides is more than enough as we walk in the light that we have, as we test for the purpose of approving what is acceptable to God, and as we rebuke the unfruitful and confront the unfruitful works of darkness by our words and deeds. By our words and deeds, we will confront and rebuke or reprove the unfruitful works of darkness by what we do and say because we have received and are following God's guidance and we are under his protection. Remember that. Remember what we talked about today. It all boils down to this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. So we've got to receive, test, and approve God's guidance. When we do that, we can then be the light of the world. That's what Jesus said we were, right? We're salt and light. In order to be salt and light, we must receive God's guidance. And so we're talking, we've been talking about the last month. We've got one more sermon in this series. And when we're done, I pray that we will all know how to seek and find and determine God's will for our lives. You know, in God's word, and I'm talking now to those who are on the phone and or maybe looking on Facebook Live. Uh, I want to talk to you now. In God's word, there is an invitation that's given to all mankind. And it's an invitation that can be received with joy or it can be pushed aside and never accepted. You know, there's a scripture in Matthew, it's, uh, chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's an invitation. In the context of what Jesus was speaking, he was talking to those uh, uh, in, in his day. But the application of the invitation is vital to us today. It teaches us that all can come to Christ. It doesn't matter how rich or poor, how great or small, how powerful or weak, Jesus is the Savior of all mankind and extends his invitation to all. 
just as with invitations that we receive for different things, this invitation can be accepted or rejected. Jesus does not and will not force anyone to accept his invitation. He leaves that up to the individual. Now, when one, somebody receives an invitation, normally they come with some directions as to how to reply or how to get the location or how to get there or how to come to the affair. The same is true with the invitation extended by God. Uh, his book, the Bible, which we've talked about today, tells us how to respond to the invitation and what to do in order to respond. But here's how. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if there's anyone today who can hear me, who's not accepted Jesus' invitation for eternal life, remember Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised it from the dead, you will be saved. That's the invitation. Accept it or reject it. I urge you to accept it. If you accept it, you can transition just like my granddaughter did. Right? With, with joy and peace. Otherwise, you don't know. You don't know. If you don't know today that when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord, then you need to accept his invitation. So do that today if you have not done that. I want to share something with you that was given to me today by our guest. Uh, and I want to share this with you today as, as we leave. And remember this is in connection with this invitation. Here's a question. Do you want to live forever? Here's the way. So it, and what it is is a prayer to accept Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read it. It's based on uh, Romans 10, 13. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a lost sinner. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, my, I'll open my heart to you. I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he died for my sins, and God raised him from the dead. Lord, I thank you now for my salvation in Jesus' name. If you said that prayer today or in the past, and you meant it, and those of you who are listening to me today, if you said that today and you meant it with all your heart, you are saved. No if, ands, or buts about it, you will say. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You are saved because the word of God says you're saved. Don't rely on your feelings. Continue in prayer. Read your Bible. And thank God for his son, Jesus, who is your Savior and Lord. You are saved. So that's what I said before. If you accepted Jesus today, tell somebody. Don't keep it a secret. Tell somebody. And once that happens, you can then be assured that you will receive the guidance of God. You'll know what God's will is for you in your life. I love you. Thank you for those guests that are here today. We would love to see you again. Thank God. I thank God for the triathlon because if it hadn't been for that, you would not be here today. Thank God for that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
knowing that if the Lord your labor is not in vain. God bless you. I love you. Here's my hug from up here. I love you.